And I'd like to just start with, a, uh, this, with just a brief statement about sort of where we stand in this thing, and I'll very simplify the world. But the way I see NIV in the COPD world, until about five years ago, virtually every study that was out was negative, showed very little improvement in survival, quality of life, or anything. And people still did it, mainly in Europe, but they didn't do it in the United States because the data would not support it. Then the Windish group sort of started using this higher intensity, higher pressure level, higher respiratory rate approach to try to lower the, the CO2. And they early small studies it's a potential benefit. That led to two larger studies that came out, the uh, Colleen and Windisch study in Germany, which took basically patients with chronic, stable hypercapnic COPD and showed they could improve longevity, basically, survival improved, reduced hospitalization, followed by Peter Wistra's study in basically an acute respiratory failure in which they continued the NIV and they showed basically no improvement. So I think it's still, the, the story is out, or the, the jury is out still on whether NIV in the COPD population consistently and has value and in whom it consistently has value. And so tonight, or this evening, I think we've got a very interesting uh, new set of data to put into this, and we'll try to put that data into perspective with the studies that I just described to you. So with that in mind, I'll turn the program over to Holger, who will introduce our speakers. And it's most certainly our pleasure, you know, to have this on, on a Tuesday evening, this full room to, I think, discuss one of the most exciting studies that was presented here um, at this year's ERS. And so for the first talk, we want to invite Patrick Murphy, um, the local champion, may we say, for today, who's going to introduce us into the hot HMV study objectives, the methodology, and the results. Thank you, Patty. Thank you very much, Holger. Um, so, I'm going to talk through the objectives, methodology, and, uh, and expand on the results that we discussed first thing this morning. So, as my conflict of, in, uh, uh, of in, in interest disclosure, I, I'm not going to dwell on the, on the background too much. Non invasive ventilation in acute hypercapnic decompensated respiratory failure has a very good evidence base and has been a gold standard for, for a number of years. Yet, we know once you've had one of those acute decompensated hypercapnic exacerbations, your outcomes are really poor. This is people having their first admission with an episode of decompensated hypercapnic respiratory failure and you can see an almost 40% mortality at three months. So, so these patients do very badly. And up until very recently, we haven't had very many treatment options that we can offer. This is the kaplan meier prop from the rescue study, which showed non-invasive ventilation didn't seem to offer any additional benefits to standard care in these patients who've recently had an acute exacerbation. However, we, we really felt that the, the data uh, needed improving and, and that if we selected the right patients and used the intervention in the right way, that we might well be able to affect a, a change in this very uh, frail and multi-morbid group. So the hypothesis of the HOS HMV trial uh, was that if you used home mechanical ventilation, titrated it to nocturnal hypoventilation, you'd be able to improve admission-free survival in those patients who'd had a, an acute, recent, life-threatening exacerbation of COPD who had ongoing, persistent hypercapnia. Now, in terms of trial design, we used a multi-center, uh, open-label, randomized control trial design. We used 15 centers uh, within the UK, and we, we, we powered it using real-world data from the UK. So data from the Leeds cohort, which, which showed about a 55% readmission rate at one year, which we felt we could reduce to around 25% with non-invasive ventilation. It was powered assuming a dropout rate of about 22%, uh, and that gave us a power of 80 with uh, 116 patients randomized on a one-to-one -one basis. <coughs> now, we randomized via minimization, because e even though this was, you know, this is a small trial, 116 patients, and therefore we were uh, aware that we didn't want any significant imbalances in those areas that we knew were going to uh, affect our primary outcome. So we, we minimised for age uh, using a cutoff of 65. For BMI, because we know those cachectic patients do badly uh, with a BMI of 20, we uh, minimised for, for uh, established use of long-term oxygen therapy prior to randomization, frequency of exacerbations uh, more, more than three or less than three, and current centre of recruitment. So we wanted to try and balance those elements within the study. Now, just to give you uh, a brief overview, so the patients needed to have an acute exacerbation of COPD, needing non-invasive ventilation. Uh, then that index admission, we gave them two weeks once their pH had improved to greater than 7.3.
two weeks to, to wait to see whether they continue to have ongoing persistent hypercapnia. And we chose a level of seven, assuming that even within two weeks there would be some ongoing improvement after that time, um, but that they're likely to have had significant chronic respiratory failure. We then randomised them to either home oxygen therapy alone or home oxygen therapy and home mechanical ventilation. They had oxygen therapy in trained at the lowest uh, rate that could improve their PO2 to greater than eight, and NIB titrated to abolish nocturnal hypoventilation. Our, our primary outcome was admission-free survival and a range of secondary outcomes. Now, in terms of our, our inclusion criteria, as I said, it was important, important that they'd had an inpatient admission with acute hypercapnic exacerbation of COPD, that goes without saying. They needed to have COPD. And we'll, we'll, you use that with a pack year history of over 20 with an FVV1 of less than 50% and, and a moderately obstructed ratio of less than 60. Now, they needed to have persistent hypercapnia with a resolution of their acidosis for at least two weeks, and they needed to have chronic hypoxia, so meet the standard criteria for, for LTOT, although not the standard as in uh, they didn't have a period of six weeks with two, two readings, but they needed to have that level of hypoxia. Now, who did we exclude from this study, or who did we prospectively exclude from the study? Well, we felt that we couldn't randomise those patients who were unable to wean off non-invasive ventilation, so those who were requiring it during the day or for more than six hours overnight to maintain a pH of, over, uh, of greater than 7.3. Those patients who developed worsening respiratory failure once NRV had been stopped uh, and they were on oxygen therapy alone. I think that's very sensible and very safe reasons to exclude people. We also wanted to exclude people who had a, a, another sensible indication for non-invasive ventilation. Most of us would feel that patients with significant obesity, significant OSA, or other causes of restrictive ventilatory defects probably wouldn't be appropriate for a randomised control trial in COPD. So those patients were all excluded. We had a cut-off of four weeks from resolution of the exacerbation, so a window to... to uh, recruit those patients when they were in that recovery phase. So we didn't want those patients who'd had exacerbations many months ago and were, were in a long established stable phase. We also excluded those patients with other significant morbidities that would maybe affect the primary outcome. So unstable coronary syndromes, renal replacement therapy, or those patients who'd been intubated during their index exacerbation, because that confers a very different prognosis. We also excluded those patients who weren't able to tolerate NIV, assuming that those patients who couldn't tolerate it acutely were unlikely to tolerate it in the home setting. We also excluded those patients who couldn't consent uh, or were pregnant or under 18, which is obviously rarely <laughs> applicable in this patient group. So who did we target? Well, we were targeting severe COPD patients with a recent life-threatening exacerbation with chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure in their recovery phase without significant sleep disorder breathing or other causes of respiratory failure. And the intervention was administered in that recovery phase before established stabilisation. As I said, the primary outcome was admission-free survival. So that's admitted to hospital for any cause uh, or death within the year of follow-up. We use a, a range of secondary outcomes that we'll talk about, health status and readmissions, which are important, other forms of exacerbations, uh, arterial blood gas, sleep measures, uh, both actigraphy in the home and overnight oximetry capnography, as well as other quality of life measures. As we've discussed uh, and has been mentioned, the high-pressure, high-intensity approach that has been advocated uh, by the groups in Germany, Wolfram Vindition and Mike Dreher, uh, we, we adopted a very similar approach. So uh, a high-pressure strategy of reducing transcutaneous CO2 by delivery uh, of non-invasive ventilation, but not necessarily with a high backup rate as we hadn't found that particularly helpful. Um, and we used a, a, an algorithm on our patients aiming for, to start with an IPAP of 18 and titrate up to 25, although that was obviously as tolerated uh, and as required. Now, there's, there's, there's one thing who you intend to recruit for a study and there's another thing who you do recruit for a study. So we screened 2,000 patients. This was a long study, first patient randomised in 2010 uh, and the last patient in 2015. So it was a big number that we, re that, that we screened for eligibility for the trial. And so you need to look in detail at this number to understand whether it's applicable or not, and I think it is. If we look at that 2,000 patients, obviously 116 were randomised into the study, so you have 1,900 patients. If you then look at those patients who, who wouldn't or couldn't partake in the study, i.e. died prior to screening during the index admission, declined taking part in the study, were unable to consent, that removes about a third of the patients. So there's about 
1,200 patients left. And then if you exclude those patients who have another good indication for non-invasive ventilation. So these patients, uh, I think, would be getting non-invasive ventilation outside of the context of a clinical trial. Those patients with uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure and OSA, those with hypercapnic respiratory failure and significant obesity, or all those that decompensated with respiratory failure who are unable to wean are all likely to get non-invasive ventilation anyway. So that gives us a pool of about 800 patients that we were looking at in the trial. Uh, and half of those patients, 400 of that 800, had significant improvement in their daytime gases, i.e. they had hi significant hypercapnic respiratory failure during their acute admission, but that had resolved by the time they came to screening. So we recruited about 15% of the suitable population, and as I said, the biggest reason for not re being recruited was resolution of that hypercapnic respiratory failure. Uh, and that's the big difference between the patient population that we looked at in our study and those that were in the rescue trial. Now, I think what's also important is we recruited patients, but what happened to them when we recruited them? Well, we didn't lose any to follow up, uh, and we had a dropout rate of about 16%, which was well within our 22% uh, that we specified in our power calculation. But actually, it was slightly better than that, because some of those patients withdrew after reaching the primary outcome. So in terms of the primary outcome analysis, the dropout rate was about 10%, so well within our 22%. And as I said, we didn't lose any patients to follow up. We knew the health status of all of the patients at the either withdrawal of the trial or at trial termination. Now, who did we recruit for this study? Well, these are the sort of COPD patients I think that we're all seeing in clinical practice. So they're older, median ages of, of 66 and 67 in the two groups. They, they were largely on the thinner side because we'd excluded those with obesity, so BMIs of 21 and 22. And so that's probably less than you think of in your general practice, but that's because we'd excluded those with a BMI of over 35. They were frequent exacerbators with 50% or, or having three or more exacerbations within the 12 months that were uh, preceding the index admission. admission. They were also about half female, half male, which differs quite a lot to a lot of the earlier COPD work. And they had significant airflow obstruction, FEV1s of 600 mils, a uh, 24% predicted. These were a, a, a sick bunch of patients. And then if we look at their uh, arterial blood gas analysis, PO2s of 6.4 and PCO2s of 7.9. So very well matched these two patient groups. No significant difference in any of these baseline variables. And these ABGs were performed on air following a night of oxygen therapy without non-invasive ventilation. They also had significant impairment both in terms of health-related quality of life, whether measured by the SGRQ, the SRI, or dyspnea by the NRC, MRC dyspnea score. Now, when we were looking at their baseline sleep studies, one thing that's important is that there was no significant obstructive sleep apnea in this patient population. So respiratory polygraphy uh, was performed in, in a subset of, of patients to well validate it, and the, the AHI was, as you can see, less than five. What was the intervention that was given? The home oxygen therapy group got one litre of oxygen uh, uh, as a medium between half and two litres, uh, very similar in the combined hot HMV group. We delivered relatively high pressures, a median of 24 with an EPAP of 4, uh, and a modest backup rate at 14. Now, the primary outcome for the trial, uh, as we showed this morning, showed a significant difference. So those patients with uh, receiving both uh, home mechanical ventilation as well as home oxygen therapy uh, in the red line uh, here had a, a median admission-free survival time of over four months, 4.3 months, in comparison to the blue line, which is the home oxygen therapy alone, and you can see a median survival or median admission-free survival, rather, of 1.4 months. Uh, and that gave us a, 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 an unadjusted odds ratio of 0.54 or an adjusted uh, hazard ratio of 0.49, which was highly statistically significant, a p-value of 0. 0.002. Now, in terms of the adjustment factors, we adjusted via the minimization criteria, so age, previous use of LTOT, uh, the, the BMI and so on. Those same criteria were used to adjust because we knew they were the criteria that would affect our primary outcome. And what does that translate to to our, cl our clinical practice? Well, that we need to treat six of these patients with both home mechanical ventilation and home oxygen therapy to prevent one admission or death over the, the, the 12 months. So we think, well, we've had a significant positive result, and, and, and how, do we, how does that differ from, from some of the previous data? And I said one of the most important things is we needed to show that we demonstrated that we ventilated the patients. I think that's an important difference between this, these data uh, and some of the earlier data. Uh, and if we're looking at this, both looking at mean tr transcutaneous CO2 and, and peak transcutaneous CO2 on the, on the patient population, as you can see, a significant treatment effect uh, in, that, in the combined group uh, of about a kilopascal 
uh, in both factors, which is highly statistically significant. And just in graphical form, this is the same data, but you can see an improvement in terms of the difference between pre-treatment and post-treatment levels in the ventilated patients, both in mean and peak CO2s, and differences in the treatment discharge levels between the home oxygen therapy alone and the, and the home oxygen therapy and home mechanical ventilation groups. So we know we ventilated these patients, and I think that is important. Now, that level of ventilation did translate to improvement in terms of arterial blood gases, a, a reduction between groups, a treatment effect of about half a kilopascal. There was statistical up until the three months levels, and then there was some dilution of that effect. Although at 12 months, uh, the difference, although not statistically significant, still around the same sort of level of treatment effect of about half a kilopascal, but not statistically significant. And part of that is the diminution in, in numbers, and, and that's because by the time of 12 months, we'd obviously had a, a, an approximately third mortality rate in, in, in those patients. Now, one thing that people are concerned about in terms of uh, the delivery of, of non-invasive ventilation in, in this patient group is an effect on, on health-related quality of life. We know from the AVCAL data there was concerns raised that although there was a, a modest treatment effect, that there was some reduction in health-related quality of life in the NIB group. We didn't see any of that effect. Using the SRI score, which is a uh, health-related quality of life score specifically for patients with sleep disorder, breathing and, and respiratory failure, showed significant benefits within the first six weeks. Now, those benefits did reduce over time uh, and there was no statistically significant difference over the prolonged follow-up. However, there was no suggestion that there were worse health-related quality of life. So there was no suggestion of, of, a, of an effect of deterioration caused by the ventilation within this group. So we have a trial that shows a significant benefit in a group that we think is slightly different from those other patient populations. But what makes up that admission-free survival? We used a, uh, a combined endpoint of either admissions uh, or uh, death by 12 months. So if we look at mortality alone, what, what differences uh, did we see in this patient group? And actually we saw similar levels of death within that 12 months. And this Kaplan-Meier plot, not statistically significant, although you can see that the home oxygen group do slightly worse. There's no statistical significance between these two factors. Now what I think is important is we look at the cause of death in those patients. And this is taken from the death registry. So this is what's registered on their death certificate, uh, which is in the UK how we uh, record uh, the cause of death. And you see the vast majority, the cause of death was listed as COPD uh, alone. There was pneumonia, respiratory failure, lung cancer and corporal pneumonia. So the vast majority, uh, 34 of those 35 deaths over the 12 months were respiratory in nature. One cause of death was attributed to congestive cardiac failure. So if it wasn't uh, a, a mortality difference between these two arms, uh, what was leading to the admission-free survival. Uh, and we'd always had this thought in our mind that NIV might not change the disease process, but those patients at least would be able to exacerbate at home on their ventilator rather than an admission. And in that severely unwell group, that might offer some benefits. But actually, what was interesting is we saw a reduction in the rate of exacerbations within that patient population. So not only uh, was the admission-free survival prolonged, but if you looked at all exacerbations, not just those that led to a hospital admission, but those that led to treatment changes in the community, a reduction from five to fewer than four per patient per year. But one can see that the median number of exacerbations in these patients are significant. So these patients having on average four exacerbations in the hot HMV group and five in the home oxygen therapy alone, but with a significant treatment effect, both statistically significant uh, and with a hazard ratio that, that would, uh, I think, encourage you that this may have a true treatment effect. So having looked through the data, what can we say? Well, we know that if we pick the right group, we seem to be able to affect outcomes in this. Those patients with persistent hypercapnia following a life-threatening exacerbation benefit from home non-invasive ventilation in addition to home oxygen therapy. There's a, a, a prolongation of admission-free survival and a reduction in actual exacerbation rate. Uh, I think when we're contrasting it to previous data, um, the persistent hypercapnia is important and therefore that's going to need us to change our practice and how we monitor those patients following an acute exacerbation uh, in our general practice. But you need to titrate that to the nocturnal hypoventilation. <coughs> so there needs to be uh, some nuance to that. Uh, and I think most importantly, these patients don't seem to have any uh, deterioration in their quality of life with the burden of home ventilation. And obviously, we need to thank those that uh, contributed to this trial. And as I said, it was a, a prolonged period and a number of centres across the UK. Uh, and the research teams at, at all of those centres did a great job at making sure us, you know, that we lost no patients 
during that study uh, to follow up. So I think we, we need to thank those. And obviously, uh, both ResMed and Philips who are sponsoring this session, but also uh, the study as a whole, uh, which was also co-funded by the Guys and St. Thomas's charity. Um, many thanks for your time. Thank you, Petty. So we have time for a couple of immediate questions. Other than that, we're going to have a panel discussion with the experts at the end. So if you have an immediate question, please come to the microphone. You chose a cutoff of 7.30 for the trial as opposed to a more conventional 7.35. Now, the reason I ask this is if, so what you're showing is a reduction of exacerbations in the group which is on concomitant home oxygen, uh, nocturnal oxygen along with uh, home mechanical ventilation. So could I make an argument that the fact that one arm was just on home oxygen and that was the reason why it was driving more exacerbations in that arm rather than an yeah. effect of home mechanical ventilation? Yeah, no, 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 and, and uh, the, the point was raised by uh, Professor Narva this morning, uh, and it's a valid point. We, we chose 7.30 because these patients were not still in the acute phase, uh, that there is some fluctuation, you know, day to day, uh, and therefore we didn't want to exclude patients with a pH of 7.34 two weeks ago, um, you know, for, for, from entering the trial, because cl the, clinically they were stable. They were no longer in that acute phase, and, and that, that's important. They were assessed by a senior respiratory clinician with experience in both home ventilation. I think we should I should also say that out of that 116 patients, seven patients had a pH of between 7.30 and 7.35, so a, a small number. Of those seven patients, five patients were in the home ventilation arm and only two patients in the, uh, in the home oxygen therapy arm. So, so, so I'm, I'm not sure that it had a significant effect. Uh, and so it's a very valid point, but the data is there for us to say actually it didn't have any bearing on the results. And a slightly different question, different to your presentation, actually. Uh, but if sort of high intensity ventilation is so very effective, why is it not something we are replicating in sort of inpatient care when the patients are admitted in hospital? So why are we not giving them high intensity NIV when they come in with acidotic respiratory failure? Why are there no trials uh, on that particular bit? I, I mean, we are giving them high intensity NIV. It's an infection. Maybe that's a different practice. I, I mean, the BTS guidelines uh, are to, t you know, uh, from a British point of view, are to titrate ventilation. The, the EPOV study, the data which was presented a number of years ago, suggested high pressure was associated with better use and quicker resolution of symptoms. We should be giving these patients high pressure ventilation but I mean the point's been made the the the, the pressure or the intensity is not the answer that you know you, you they need the pressure they need to ventilate them they need the backup rate they need to ensure they get a, a, a mandatory a minimum ventilation during deep sleep that you, you know you, you don't need to put, push the pressure up if their CO2 is coming down the, 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 they're recovering the, the, reaching a high pressure is not the result the result is reducing CO2 and improving outcomes uh, and that can be done on a range of, of inspiratory pressures. I think the important thing is to not underventilate the patient because we know that homeopathic ventilation is just that. It's, it's, it's a sham. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Um, just a, a question that is really uh, curious, curious. What is the main reason you, you, you think that uh, your mortality rate is so different from the Conline study? First, and uh, is it because you tr your criteria for applying non-invasive ventilation in a control group when they got exacerbated, is less less is less aggressive than the one practiced by the Conline study because the the great major the, the great difference between mortality in one year in the Conline study is very uh, impressive. Yeah, probably because the control group was not treated so well with non-invasive ventilation when they got exacerbated, and in your group they were. Yes, so I, I think uh, you know it's an important caveat for, for the, the cone line data is, is that they were precluded from acute NIV unless the CO2 was greater than 10, and that wasn't the case in in this group. They all got acute NIV. I think also uh, that 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 because we were doing a time to event analysis uh, and the trial steering committee felt strongly that we could not withhold non-invasive ventilation for those people who were, were in the control arm and had reached the primary outcome. So 17 of the 59 patients in the, in the home oxygen therapy arm switched to home mechanical ventilation, uh, 12 of those patients after meeting the primary outcome. So, so the, 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 there was an attrition, and that probably is diluted on mortality effect to some degree. Um, I, I think we are, because the trial was, was elongated, as they often are, uh, we, we will hopefully soon have the five-year uh, mortality data to look at, and, and I think that may be interesting and give us a, a stronger signal. I, I think the other caveat compared with the, the, the German patients was these were a sicker group. You know, they were frequent exacerbators, uh, and we know that confers a worse problem prognosis and I think we're unlikely to see such a dramatic benefit in this really frail, you know, high exacerbation rate group. 
Did their daytime oxygenation improve? Or did anyone come off long-term oxygen therapy? So uh, there, there was, the, the patients did come off long-term oxygen therapy, although few. Uh, there wasn't a significant difference between uh, the home oxygen therapy and the home mechanical ventilation in the number of those people who had oxygen withdrawal over the trial. Uh, that's one of the secondary outcomes that we looked at. I haven't presented that data because uh, there's just not enough time to present everything. The, the, the oxygen it improved, but there was no statistically significant treatment effect between the groups. And how many hours per night did people use it? So at six weeks, an average of 4.7, and that increased slowly over the 12 months of the trial. So at the end of the trial, it was a mean use of seven hours. Mean use of seven hours? At the end of the trial. Why was an exclusion criteria then using it, needing it to use it more than six hours? So, so the exclusion criteria, we, 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 we thought that those people using it more than six hours overnight uh, were probably, to, to maintain a pH of, of over 7.3 in clinical stability, probably we felt couldn't have NIV withdrawal because they were the group that may well rapidly decompensate. Um, so, so that was the rationale between excluding those at the onset, assuming that although uh, it, it wasn't there to exclude those patients who tolerated it well, but it was those who couldn't have less, fewer than six hours prior to assessment. How many had more than one excess, uh, NIV uh, needing uh, exacerbation before uh, going into the study? Uh, so the, the, we, we uh, in terms of minimization criteria, we just used uh, all admissions. We didn't pre-specify whether they were um, NIV dependent admissions or not. Uh, so, so there were three acute admissions. It was 50% in, 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 in the cohort as a whole had three or more uh, admissions of any kind. Uh, when we've looked at the data, and again, it wasn't minimization criteria, so I've not presented it, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was about 50% uh, to 60% again that had one or more previous uh, acute admission needing NIV. So it may be a, a very special exacerbator phenotype, uh, actually, with uh, more, with very sensitive to oxygen when arriving to the, to the acute care. Uh, uh, I mean, we didn't see, uh, obviously, the, those patients who are oxygen sensitive uh, and we, you know, th those are the patients who decompensate and, and recover usually to eucapnia or, or minimal hypercapnia following <coughs> treatment with NIV uh, and withdrawal and judicious oxygen usage. So, so I don't think we were finding patients uh, who were very oxygen sensitive. As I said, in, in the t out of those 2,000 patients that we uh, screened, only eight were excluded because of decompensation with the initiation of oxygen therapy. So it, it, it's a clinically insignificant number.